grab your Bibles with me and turn to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. Have you ever set a date on the calendar and you're like, I can't wait for that day? <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, it was like when school's out, right? <laughs> it's like the last day of school. And I, I would look forward to it. And, and, and of course, my generation, we didn't have, like, okay, we, we did have Ataris, 2600. Uh, anyone know what an Atari 600, 2600? Combat, it came with the system. That's the only game we ever had. Mom and dad were like, you can buy it for Christmas. And we used our Christmas money. We bought the Atari, but that's the only game we ever had. My friend had Pitfall. That wasn't too bad. But, but a combat, you play it once, and it's like, this is the most boring thing. I'm going to go back outside. So, um, yeah, so back in the days when we went outside and we rode our bikes and we played outside and did things like that, I look forward to that last day of school. I can't wait for that last day of school. For others of you, maybe it's your... Uh, uh, your, your, last, your last day of, of work. I was just talking to someone the other day who's getting ready to retire this year. And they're like counting down the days and the meetings and the, and the days in the office. They, they got it all figured out. They can't wait for that day when that, when that day comes. And, and uh, some of you, if you're, you can go back and remember, like, uh, way, some of us is way back, but can you remember, like, when you were, f- when you're engaged, and, and you, you had that date set, finally, and you're looking forward to that day when you're going to walk down the aisle with your hunk of hunk of burning love, and you're just like, you're like, I can't wait for this, and I know, I'm sure my wife was that way, and, and, um, and, and you just, you're, you're looking forward to that day when that was going to happen. Now we jump into the word of God, (laughs) because that's where Joshua was. That's where the children of Israel were. Oh, can I, can I just take you on a one minute history tour? Just real quick. I just stay with me. One minute history tour, give or take five minutes. But here's, here's the tour. You ready for this? There's this dude named Jacob in the old Testament. Okay. Let's just start there. Jacob is in the old Testament. He's married to Rachel. And, and they ended up having a kid whose name was Joseph. Now, Rachel died uh, when, they were giving, when he, she was giving birth to their youngest son, Benjamin. And so at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, Jacob and the boys moved to Hebron in Israel, moved to Hebron. They're living there. And, uh, and uh, this isn't good, but Jacob's favorite was Joseph. His favorite son was Joseph. And uh, you might have heard the story about the, um, uh, the multicolored coat or whatever that, that his dad. And, and so his brothers didn't like Joseph. And so they sold Joseph into what? Into slavery. Do you remember that? They sold Joseph into slavery. And he ends up, so like they're, if, if they're over here in Israel, he ends up over here in Egypt. And so he's over here in Egypt, and uh, he had some tough times because, but he, well, listen, he was, he was a man of God, and he did what was right, but it just seemed like um, sometimes he just got the short end of the stick. Um, but God, because he was faithful, Joseph stayed faithful, and God blessed him. And there was a, a time then when, when um, Joseph was the second in command. You remember that? There was the king, and then there was Joseph. And there was a famine that hit, hit the land, the whole area. At this point, Jacob, dad, and all his, bro- his sons, the other brothers of Joseph, they thought probably Joseph was dead. They didn't know what happened to him. But they was like, there's famine. I hear they got food in Egypt. Someone over there in Egypt was thinking ahead, and they, they had saved up in case there was a famine. Someone, they had no idea who that someone was, was their son and their brother. And so they go over there. And they go to Joe. If movie theaters, uh, Hollywood couldn't write this any more powerfully. I mean, if you've never read the book of Genesis, can I encourage you? Dive in, read it, get this, just dwell on it, think on it. <laughs> and long story short, Joseph then received his brothers, and it's a, it was quite an or- ordeal, but it received them. Dead. And the king was like, oh, Oh, these are your family? These are your kin folks? Well, well, load them all up and let's move to Beverly. No, it wasn't Beverly. It was, uh, the king was like, I'll, I'll give them a place to, to live. Um, if this is your family, Joseph, and I love you and appreciate you, I'm going to let your family come stay. Let's see where. Bristol, no. Middlebury, no. Goshen, yeah. Goshen. 
Okay, it's true, read it in the Bible. Well, not the Bristol Middlebury part, but they did land in Goshen. So they said, come live in Goshen, and that's where Goshen gets its name. Okay, so the Israelites, uh, God's people, the Hebrew people, they lived in Goshen then, and that's how they ever got to Egypt. Now, most of you, you've seen Charlton Heston, you've, you've seen... Uh, the Prince of Egypt movie, perhaps. And you know that eventually there was a dude that God raised up named what? Moses to come stand before um, the, the Pharaoh and say, let, God says, let my people go that they might worship me. You, they're over here in Goshen and, and, and they're enslaved, you see, because now it was, it was hundreds of years. They were enslaved. They were enslaved. Why did, were they enslaved? Well, uh, we don't have time to go into that. But these are God's people, the Israelites, in fact, Jacob, his name was changed to what? It was changed to Israel. Ah, that's how they came up with the name Israelites. They were Hebrews. They were Israelites. And they're, they're living over here. And they're enslaved for hundreds of years. And they're living on land that really wasn't even theirs in the first place. And so I'm sure that played into how they allowed themselves to be brought into slavery. But they're like, they're reproducing like rabbits. And so now what happens? Joseph is gone. Joseph dies. And not everyone who's in leadership over here in Egypt, they don't remember Joseph very well. They don't remember what a blessing he was to their country. He saved them from a famine and all the wisdom that God had given them. And so they didn't treat Joseph's family very well. They continued to, they pulled them into slavery and they were slaves for hundreds of years. And so hundreds of years are just this is where they're at, and they're, they remember stories. They've heard stories about the Abrahamic covenant. I'm going way back now. But where, where they, they were going to go to the promised land. They were promised the promised land, and they knew where they, they were going. But how are we going to get there? And God raises up Moses, and Moses comes in, in through several plagues. Ten plagues says, let my people go there. They might worship me. And so then Moses, what, leads them out of slavery. Woo! The Red Sea crossing. Um, that's all happening right here. Moses is leading them through. But for 40 years, they wandered in that desert because God had some things he needed to work out in them. By the time, by the time they got through that, that little dip, if you will, and they, they took that 40 days in the desert, Moses is now dead. And his assistant, Joshua, who had seen almost all the miraculous stuff, and Joshua is now leading God's people, the Israelites. And Moses and Joshua's there, and that's where we catch up with them in Joshua chapter 3. Look at this map. Now, they were in, uh, you'll notice two, two words, of, uh, names of cities are underlined there. Um, they made their way. This is, this is Joshua, and there's coming out, of, coming out of Egypt, coming out of the, uh, and now they're coming up, and they're in, in Shittim. Now, I, I wouldn't have to use the long eye there. <clears throat> But I'm going to shite them, and I'm going to talk about that out in Colossians in about 10, 15 minutes. And so it's a, uh, yeah, watch your mouth. So they're they're in they're in sh- shite them, <laughs> and I can just imagine, God, this is God's promised land. Have you ever you remember that time when you're like, I can't wait for this day. Maybe it's even a vacation. You're like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And Joshua says, we're there. Woo. This is what God promised our forefather Abraham for us. And it's going to be awesome. We're going to be, we're going to be in the promised land, Canaan land. We're going to be here. This is going to be great. But in order, the first battle, the first place that they had to take on was to cross that Jordan River and go into Jericho. And you remember how they marched around Jericho? We're getting ahead of ourselves. We're not even going to talk about that today. But that was the first battle. And, but Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, they're there. Now, what does is, what is Joshua, what does God say to Joshua? What does God tell Joshua to do at this point? I better turn there myself. Okay, here we go. Verse 5, Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourself. What is consecration? That's a big church word, isn't it? Consecration. Separating yourself from things that are unclean, especially anything that would contaminate your relationship with a holy God. Set yourself apart. 
You know, this is, what, this is the whole message. You don't even have notes. I don't have fill in the blanks. I don't have anything like that. Sorry. If you want discussion questions for your life group, we do have some discussion questions at the Welcome Center. You can feel free to grab some of those. But, uh, but here, here's, here's what I want you to get. Oftentimes, when God was getting ready to do something powerful, he would tell his people, consecrate yourselves. In fact, the title of this message is actually, Change Your Clothes. Because that's what he would say. He said, change your clothes. Do something on the outside of what I really want you to be doing on the inside. What do you mean, Scott? Well, let's just look. In Genesis chapter 35, you can, you can turn to all these scriptures or they'll be on the screen. It's up to you how fast you're, uh, you're able to, to turn in, in scriptures. But in, in Genesis chapter 35, we're going back to Jacob, Israel. We're going back to Jacob, right? God, God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel. Settle there, build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. Have you ever heard of Jacob's Ladder? I mean, that, God, God downloaded a pretty amazing vision to Jacob in, in, uh, when he was in Bethel the last time. In verse 2, so Jacob said to his whole household and all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let's go up to Bethel where I build an altar to God who answered me in the day of distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. Purify yourselves. Change your clothes. I believe God's word for us, I shared this initially in a prayer night that we had last fall, but I still believe it today. I believe God has something awesome he's getting ready to do, just like um, uh, when, when he parted the Jordan River so that the Israelites could cross that and they could go into the promised land, just like we see here where there was a bunch of bloodshed in Genesis chapter 34. It was, it was bad news, and God said, come on, I, you, there's, I've got something better for you. Jacob, this is what I need you to do. Change your clothes. Consecrate yourself. Become holy before me. This is what I want you to see. I'm getting ready to do something powerful in your lineage, Jacob, Israel. I'm getting ready. Change your clothes. We see this more than one place. How many of you know what happened in Exodus chapter 20? You didn't know you are going to play Trivia Pursuit today. Uh, the Bible category. What happened in Exodus chapter 20? Half that, and you'll get a clue. <clears throat> Ten commandments. But have you, ever, have you ever focused on what happens in Exodus chapter 19? Before there's ever a Ten Commandments, do you know what God said to, to uh, Moses? Here it is. Look at this. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes. Change your clothes. Change your clothes. Consecrate yourselves. And be ready by the third day because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. I'm getting ready to do something here. I'm getting ready to do something powerful. But in order for you to get there, you got to prepare your heart. you got to consecrate yourself. You gotta set things aside. You gotta purify yourself. Get rid of your other gods, is what he had told Jacob in Genesis 35. Get rid of those other gods. Get rid of those things and just focus on me and me alone. Change your clothes. He told Joshua, tell them before we even go any further, it's gonna be really powerful. It's gonna be awesome, is what scripture says. But you need to consecrate yourself. He told Jacob, go to Bethel. But before you do, you got to consecrate. you got to change your clothes. He, he said, I'm getting ready to pour out the Ten Commandments. I'm going to download onto Moses' tablets exactly what the Ten Commandments are. I'm getting ready to speak. It was an awesome move of God that day. I just imagine you were there, and you're, you know that Moses and, is up there on on mountain, and he's talking, and there's rumbling, and he's like, this is holy. This is something awesome has happened. Before there was ever a Ten Commandments, before Moses ever went, he went through the camp saying, this is what we got to do. we got to consecrate ourselves, Exodus chapter 19. And then you get to the time like uh, David. You know, David, he, he, of course, we know he killed Goliath. Huge victory. But he also um, committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then to try to hide all that, he, he killed Bathsheba's husband. Well, he didn't kill him, but put him on the front line so he'd be killed in war. So in essence, he committed adultery, murdered. And then the prophet, Nathan, steps up and says, through, through some illustrations, stories, that 
David, this is you. You did this. And then um, we see in uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 12, David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves and he realized the child was dead. What child? You see, God says, I'll forgive you, but there's still consequences for your sin. And one of those consequences was that his son that was born out of that union with Bathsheba was going to lose his life. And I'm sure that David remembered the stories of Moses. I've heard the stories of Moses, and I know there were times when God was up to here with his people. God was up to here, and Moses stepped in and interceded between God and the people. Moses stepped in and said, and God's like, oh, I'm taking these people out. I'm just destroying this. I can't believe I even made these people. And Moses is like, oh, wait, 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 wait. But Lord, you remember this, and God, remember this. And, and Moses stepped in and interceded. And so David felt like, if this is because of me, because of my sin, I'm going to step in. And I'm going to intercede on behalf of my son and his life. And maybe there's a way that somehow we can change the course of things. And then, is the child dead, he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Verse 20. Then David got up from the ground and after he had washed, he put on lotions, he changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. Then he went to his own house and at his request, they served him food and he ate. David was like, I've sinned. I can't believe this. I've now lost my son. I gotta get right with God. God's like, I got something better for you, but... And he knew it. He didn't even need someone to tell him at this point. He's just like, I got to go change my clothes. I got to go. I got to put some, I got to pray. I got to worship. I get, because God's got something better for me in this season. And in order for me to get there, I got to prepare my heart. Church, I want to tell you something. Oh, you may, you may think things are going pretty good right now in my life. But I believe God's got something for you. And God's got something for this church. And I believe that God is doing something in us and among us. And he's saying, in order for you to get there, you gotta consecrate, you gotta consecrate yourself. You gotta, you gotta go, you know, I was gonna say this for later, but let me just remind you. When it comes to righteousness, there's positional righteousness and what I call practical righteousness. What do you mean? Here it is, positional. You give your life to Jesus Christ, You are born again, you're saved, you're made righteous. You're made righteous before God through Jesus Christ. You will never deserve, I will never deserve (laughs) all that Jesus Christ has done for me to forgive my sins and for you, for, for God to forgive your sins through his son, Jesus Christ. I am made righteous through Jesus Christ. My righteousness is as what? Filthy rags, scripture says. It's positional righteousness. I am, I am positioned I'm righteous through Christ. But then there's practical righteousness. And this is, this is where I, um, in uh, Colossians chapter, no, I think it's Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, it says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is where I continue to work out my salvation. This is where I, I'm saved, I'm born again. But God says, I've got something better for you. I've got something over here. I need you to... To, to cleanse yourself, get rid of some of the junk in your life. I, I have to make some decisions about me, my family, my life. I have to say, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be a part of that. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to say that because I want God to, I want to walk into the promised land. I want to walk into all that God has for me. And in order for me to get there, I've got I've to, it, it's, not, it's not as much as showing God that I mean business. God, I mean business, so therefore, I'm, doing, I'm not going to do this. Therefore, I'm going to give up this. I'm going to give up this. And it's not so much showing God you mean business. It's I just want my heart to be right before God, pure before God. Consecrate yourself. Separate yourself from the worldly thought processes, the worldly desires. Separate yourself from those things. As we go into the New Testament, it's this principle that we see even in the Gospel of John. And John, it won't be on the screen, but John chapter 15, verse 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish will be given to you. If you remain in me, God says, and my word remains in you. 
you remain in me, if you consecrate yourself, if you set yourself apart and you commit yourself to remaining in me and my words remaining in you, then that blessing is going to come. Then I'm going to hear your prayers. Then I'm going to move on your behalf. But you got to remain in me. you got to consecrate yourself. Separate yourself from the worldly thought processes, the worldly ways, the sin of your youth. Separate yourself from that because I want to do something new in you. Let me do it. But in order for you to get there, you got to prepare your heart. you got to tenderize your... When, every time I think of that word tenderize, I, I see my mom in the kitchen taking that piece of meat. I don't even know what it was. But she had that one, one steel thing and had all these pokey things on it. And, and she would just pom, 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 pom. I, I don't know if it was a round steak or something like that. And, and I, I always wonder, why do you do that? It always tasted good, so I'm glad she did. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, she's pounding on, she's tenderizing. And she's just pom, 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 pom. And I feel like God is saying to us as a church that he, he wants to tenderize our hearts. Not not because he doesn't like us, but because he loves us. He's like, I've got something more for you. But in order for you to go there, you you gotta consecrate yourselves. You gotta be holy as I am holy. You gotta separate yourself from sinful desires and and things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we do see this. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will live with them and walk among them, and I'll be their God, and they will be my people. And then they quote the Old Testament. It says, therefore, therefore, come out from them and be separate. Consecrate yourselves. Separate yourselves, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Here's the promise. I will be a father to you. And you'll be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Come out from them. Purify yourselves. It's the same idea. Change your clothes. We have these promises, the promise that God will be a father to you, and you'll be my sons and you'll be my daughters. What an awesome promise. That every person in this room, God wants to be your father. He wants to be your father. And he's a perfect father. He wants what's best for you. There's the promise. But in order to get there fully, you got to allow him to purify you. What have I left? What have I left just, that's not that big of a deal. Uh, Actually, it is, God says. We have these promises. I believe the Lord is ready to do something even more significant in and through this church right now. And that word that Joshua said, or God said to Joshua, I will do amazing things among you. God wants to do amazing things among us. What does that mean? I don't really know. And I'm not just talking church growth here. I'm talking like, like lost people that have been lost for a long time, running from God, coming back in. I'm talking like the hardest of hearts that you've been trying to be the love of Christ and to share the love of Christ with. The hardest of hearts, finally, you've been sowing seeds, sowing, and now it's time to reap. I'm talking the hardest of hearts, finding Jesus. I'm talking the supernatural book of Acts happening in us and among us. Do you believe we can go there? I believe we can. But I believe God is saying, before we go, we've got to to consecrate ourselves. He's calling us to repentance. He's calling us to consecration. What does this look like today? Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul, did a great job helping the church of Coloss, Colossians, that book in the New Testament, to understand this. Let's just hit this, and then we'll be done. Now, these these people had died to Christ. You know, they had died, excuse me, died with Christ. And they were buried with him and and raised through water baptism. These people were saved. These people were born again. But yet, notice, they were still susceptible to the temptation and the evils of the world. And so so here, Paul just begins to just unleash this practical righteous speech here. This is how you live out your salvation practically. Here it is. He says, you might think about a few issues that you might have in your life. Is that, is that how this starts? Is that, is that the first part? You might, you might just give a little attention to some problems in your life. 
he couldn't have had a television show. He, he was too straightforward. They wouldn't allow him on the air because he said, put it to death. <laughs> Whatever belongs to your earthly nature. I use the terminology, the worldly thought process. Your, your earthly nature, that sexual, uh, stuff like sexual immorality. He says, don't just fool around with it, but put it to death. Crucify it. <laughs> Any illicit sexual relationship. In fact, the word is porn, pornea. I'm not a Greek scholar, but this is where we get our word pornography. And so any sexual immorality, put it to death. Don't live with it. For goodness sakes, allow me to give you the strength to put it to death. That's what God is saying here. Just consecrate yourself. And then he says impurity, moral uncleanness. Um, this could be sexual impurity. It could be all kinds of impurity. Evil passions that lead to sexual perversions and immorality. Just put it to death. Evil desires, wanting something that is sinister and vile in order to satisfy your own desires. Put it to death. Consecrate yourself. He's writing this to people that have already been born again, and God's forgiven them, and God's severed, but they're still dabbling in this sin. He's like, don't dabble with this sin. Crucify it. Kill it. Greed, which is idolatry. It's focusing on filling desires um, uh, with anything other than God. You have desires. You're like, I'm just, I'm just greedy for this. I'm greedy for that. And then in verse, verse 7, notice how it says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. You're born again now. You put your faith in Christ. You used to be like this. Consecrate yourselves. Come out. And, and, but now you must rid yourselves of all such uh, things as these. Rid yourselves. It, it literally, you, you study this, it literally means to take off. Rid yourselves. You see the whole idea in the New Testament now of changing your clothes. Rid yourself of this stuff. Change your clothes. Disrobe. The old filthy clothes must be taken off before the new clothes can be put on. And the believer removes the old life of sin and puts on the new life of Christ the Colossians believers, they, they had experienced this. And Paul said, you need to act this out in your lives. Get rid of this anger. Do you see that? Get rid of anger. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as anger and then rage. What's the difference between anger and rage? Someone said it this way. Anger is when you feel yourself starting to boil up and it's still on the inside and you're angry and you just maybe you act out a little bit. And then there's rage where you just let it go. You just tear into somebody. You tear into something. You're raging. You're out of control. And God says, if that's your habit, if there's, those are things that you got to get rid of. Take that off. Get rid of that. Take that off. Malice, doing evil despite the good that you've been received. It's the, malice is the deliberate attempt to harm another person. Take that off. Slander. Destroying another person's reputation by lies, by gossip, by spreading rumors. Well, I heard. Zip the lip. Slander. Filthy language. Crude talk. Abrasive language. Expletives. Shitem. Crude talk. I, Scott, does God really care if I drop that word or say that word? Does God really... I mean, really, is it even really a, co I mean, in other countries, they say that word all the time. It's just like, you know, it's, it doesn't have, but yeah, they're, they're, I'm just telling what the word says. Filthy language, crude talk, abrasive language, expletives. Paul admonishes the believers that such language much, must be caught and it must be stopped. He says, take this off, take this off. And then put this on. Look at verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, that's you, that's me, holy and dearly loved, change your clothes, take off the other stuff, and put on, clothe yourself with what? With compassion. With compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Listen, this is the dude who shakes snakes off. I mean, read about the Apostle Paul. You're like, 
Well, that Apostle Paul, he was a girly man. He must have been, he, he's all yeah, gentleness, kindness, compassion, patience. That doesn't sound like very manly things to me. Well, the Apostle Paul in, in God, more importantly, says, no, it is. This is, this is how e- even us men, we show ourselves and our, our love for God by putting these things on, by bearing with one another, forgiving the grievances that we have with one another. Forgive, because you were forgiven too. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Clothe yourselves with these things. Change your clothes. Everyone say that with me. Change your clothes. Say it again. Change your clothes. This is where we see Joshua. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Joshua was getting ready to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yeah. I mean, just, just imagine with me, dads, parents, you're there. You're on the east side of the Jordan. You, you, you know you want to get to the other side, and there's Jericho, and there's a promised land, and, and you're there. And Moses just sent, excuse me, Joshua just sent word to the whole camp. Consecrate yourself, consecrate yourself, consecrate. And you're, you're, you're okay. And, and you're like, kids, come with me. And you try to get on the highest hill, mountain, whatever. Where are we going, Dad? Just come with me, just come with me. And you're saying, the kids, listen. I want to remind you of something we've talked a lot about. Our forefather Abraham Look as far as you can. You see that river right there? It's way, oh yeah, we see that, Dad. It's the Jordan River. That's what they're getting ready to cross. And see the land even past that? Yeah. Even all that land, God says, that's, that's our people's. That's the promised land. God promised that to us, kids. That's where we're headed, kids. That's where we're going. God promised that to us, and that's why we are here today. Did you hear what Joshua said when he came through the camp? He said, before we can get to what God has promised us to, we got to consecrate ourselves. we got to make some decisions here. And that means we, we need to change our clothes, and we need to bathe, and we need to do some things. But kids, it's more than just what's on the outside that's important here. I want you to get this. It's more than what's on. We're changing our clothes, and we're, we're taking baths. Yeah, you too. We're t- taking baths tonight. All of us have that one kid that hates baths, right? You too, all of us, we're taking baths, we're changing our clothes because God's getting ready to do something powerful. And he says, we, we need to do on the outside what he wants to do on the inside. Let's prepare our hearts for that, for that next step. Let me say this again. Often when God was getting ready to do something powerful or amazing or as he says in, in just awesome among his people, he would say to them, consecrate yourselves. Change your clothes. In, in, in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, I'll just close with this. Last summer, most of you know I was on a sabbatical for three months. Every seven years, the church gives me that gift. And thank you so much again. Three months just um, uh, away from church, away from the stress, what, all that kind of stuff. But in that season, I, I, once again, I, I always find myself being drawn back to the book of Acts when I'm on sabbatical. And I studied the book of Acts. and I was going chapter by chapter. When I got to Acts chapter 3, and Peter is preaching, the apostle Peter's preaching, and he said this, he said, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I felt the Spirit of God leap inside of my soul and my spirit. And I felt like God said, I'm, I'm wanting to do some refreshing. There's a refreshing move of my spirit that's coming and I want you to lead your church to this. I want you to lead the church. I want you to lead pathway to this. But before we can get there, there's got to be repentance. You say, Scott, I've already given my life to Christ. That's okay. That's great. Are you living a lifestyle of repentance? Where every day I'm just, okay, God, I'm not, I'm not under like, boy, I ho- sure hope I don't mess up today. I should, no, no, no. I'm going to live my life according to scripture, whatever. And if I, oh man, I can't believe I thought that. I can't believe I looked at that. I can't believe I said that. I, so God, forgive me here. And it's out of that repentance, that repentance, that consecration, that that time of refreshing is going to come. 
many of us in this community, we, we understand what it is to live under bondage of rules and regulations. But I just want to declare to you what Scripture says. Jesus Christ has come to set you free from those rules and give you freedom and give you joy and give you peace and give you supernatural hope. But we've got to tenderize our hearts. We've got to prepare our hearts. You've got to live a life of repentance. You can do this. Consecrate yourself. Change your clothes. You can do this. You are already made righteous through Christ through what he did for us on the cross. Now what we need to do is to prepare our hearts and let's do some house cleaning in our lives and in our families so that God can move us into the promised land that he has for us. God's up to something. Are you willing to go there? That's the question. Are you willing to go? Would you stand with me? Close your eyes. We're going to